The Night Beat starts right now. We begin tonight with late breaking news from the city's west side. San Antonio police responding to a deadly shooting in the 900 block of Southwest 36th Street. That's near Marbach and Castroville Road. The call came in around 820 tonight. Police telling the night team's Lee Waldman. It looks like this was an attempted carjacking. She joins us live now. Lee, what have you been able to find out? Well, we know all of this happened in the Papa's Burgers parking lot. That's just behind me. That's where you see most of that police presence there. Police we spoke with earlier say a man in his 50s was leaving the restaurant, walking to his truck, and that's when he was approached by two men. Now, those two men, one pulled a gun and demanded the truck. Apparently, there was some kind of altercation between that man in his 50s and the two men. Shots were fired, and we know that, that 50, the man in his 50s was shot at least two times. Now, he did die at the scene and police tell us that the two suspects they took off on foot heading south. At this point, they say they do have several witnesses heading down to police headquarters to give them information. They don't believe anyone else was involved. They're looking at all the surveillance cameras in this area, trying to figure out more information. We saw them checking trash cans. It's a very large presence here around the corner of 36 in Castroville. We're still waiting on more details, but like I said, they're looking for those two suspects who took off heading south after the shooting happened at Papa's Burgers in that parking lot there. Reporting live on the west side, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Very active investigation scene out there. Thank you, Lee. Nine days after 32-year-old Corey Vernon was killed in a crash while riding his motorcycle on I-35, those who loved him gathering tonight to celebrate his life. For the first time, we hear from his wife and family about what kind of person he was. The night team's John Paul Barajas has his story. <laughs> One by one, tow trucks, cars, and motorcycles rode in procession to honor the life of 32-year-old Corey Vernon. On March 3rd, his life was cut short while riding his motorcycle to work on I-35 near Tupperwine Road. It was the first moment of the worst day of my life. Cindy Vernon, Corey's wife, says she can still hear the phone call saying he had passed away. According to Live Oak Police, Corey and another car were trying to merge into the same lane ahead of an 18-wheeler when they collided, shutting down the entire interstate. Please look twice when it comes to motorcycles. Keep your distance. He was hit from behind. Um, this could have been avoided. Corey's cousin, just one of many in a huge turnout for his celebration of life. Friends, family, and even co-workers from his tow truck driving days gathered to reminisce about the person who brought them together. My car was not started. What's the first thing you do when your car doesn't start? Call right? Huh? Corey was larger than life. Everything about him, he smiled constantly. Corey's personality was flamboyant and bold and kind. He would stop and do anything for anybody. Vernon was described as a man who wore many hats and had many talents. A jokester, mediator, mechanic, and simply everyone's go-to problem solver. If there was anything, we call him. Yeah. And he was always he the would one to what help he was us. Doing. And be Even if he was us. sleeping, if we called him, he would answer the phone and hello. For those in attendance, they were welcomed by goofy photos, some of the things he loved, and asked to sign his traffic vest. Corey leaves behind his wife, a young daughter, and two stepchildren. I'm going to repeat his last words to me. I will love you for the rest of my life. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. A small fire on the city's south side this evening. It appears people were working on a painting project inside and sparked a fire. It happened on Hackberry Street around 6 this evening. Fire crews were nearby and were able to contain the fire to the one room where it started. There was no major structural damage to the building and no one was hurt. The San Antonio Fire Department is investigating. We now know the name of a man who was killed in an accident early this morning. Authorities identifying him as 45 year old Salvador Torado of Pipe Creek in Bangara County. It all happened around 530 this morning on the highway near 281 in uh, Bitters Road. Police say Torado was traveling northbound on his motorcycle when an SUV hit him from behind. The female driver in that SUV telling police the bike looked stalled or slowed down in the middle of the highway. Police say the woman did not appear intoxicated and is not facing any charges. Torado was pronounced dead at the scene. San Antonio police asking for your help identifying two suspects accused of robbing a Home Depot. It happened on the city's far west side on Wednesday. Police say the people on your screen picked up a paint sprayer and a nail gun in the store. Then the two walked back through the store exiting through the lumber entrance. When a loss prevention employee tried to stop them, the male suspect tried to use a stun gun on him and took off. 
Anyone with information should call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Crime Stoppers will pay up to $5,000 for information that leads to an arrest. An update now on an Amber Alert we first told you about earlier. It has now been discontinued. 12-year-old Addison Alvarez has been found safe and tonight is in the custody of law enforcement. Police in Franklin, Texas were searching for that girl throughout the day who they say was allegedly abducted by a 35 year old woman. Once again, she was found safe. Further details are unavailable right now. President Joe Biden authorizing more military aid to Ukraine as Ukrainians continue fighting back against Russian forces who have invaded their country. More than two and a half million Ukrainians have fled the country since the violence began on February 24th. A defiant Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, warning the Russians they would have to carpet bomb Kyiv and kill all of its residents if they wanted to take the city, saying if that's their goal to, quote, bring it on. We will fight from every basement. They will lose tanks every street, every block, every crossroads. Meanwhile, President Biden has authorized another $200 million in military aid to Ukraine, including both small arms and large, arm, or large weapons, as well as more anti-armor and anti-aircraft systems. Back here at home, San Antonio Police Officers Association hosting their 10th annual Memorial Festival today. That festival will benefit to raise money for families of officers who were killed in the line of duty. It celebrates not only the fallen, but survivors and families in our community. The day full of fun activities, on-site vendors, and for the car enthusiasts, a car show on the police driving track out there at the academy. Organizers expressing their gratitude to the community. This event is incredible. Honestly, we get so much support from the community. We have uh, businesses and organizations who contribute to this uh, to event every year, and we wouldn't be able to put it on uh, as we have for now a decade. And the money made from today's festival will go to fund a trip for family members to visit Washington, D.C. to remember the fallen later this year. Outside with live cam tonight. Hope your weekend got off to a great start today. It started off very cold this morning with a widespread freeze across the entire KSAT viewing area. We're going to do that again overnight through tomorrow morning. So I hope you left your freeze prep in place, especially when it comes to plants, vegetation, because I am expecting another widespread freeze overnight. I'll show you those numbers coming up in just a bit. Today's Almanac for San Antonio, the low 26 up to 56 this afternoon, and we'll be a little closer to 70 tomorrow. Our warming trend will really start to kick in tomorrow afternoon. Now next week looks much more seasonable, but we do have a couple of fronts in the forecast. These don't affect temperatures very much, but they will affect our humidity and also bring us a brief chance of rain. We'll talk about all that to get you ready for next week coming up in just a little bit. The don't say gay bill in Florida is causing controversy around the nation, why some parents are furious and how this will affect children. And while the time change overnight will bring more daylight, weather is still gloomy in some parts of the nation. Which states are still experiencing snowstorms and severe weather? And in its event that's been canceled for the past two years because of the pandemic, but it was back in full effect today. After the break, details on today's San Antonio International Women's Day March. So it's been a growing problem for years now. Local brewers can't get their hands on enough aluminum for their cans, and when they do, they're paying a lot more for it. As the night team's Lee Waldman reports, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is making things even worse. The drafts at Alamo Beer Company are flowing, just like any Saturday. People are beginning to go out because that was one of the catalysts that caused this problem. In 2020, that problem was just beginning. More people drinking at home instead of their favorite breweries. Demand of cans outpaced supply. Unfortunately, two years later, it's gotten harder. It's gotten a lot tougher. Jaime Gerardo, chief operating officer at Alamo Beer Company, says the problem won't let up until 2024 at the earliest. We're having to get really resourceful. One problem for little breweries across the state, major can suppliers are now requiring breweries they do business with order a million cans at a time rather than the previous 200,000. That's of one label, one product, and they'll no longer warehouse them for you. The problem got worse when Russia invaded Ukraine. S&P Global reports Russian-based Rusal is one of the largest aluminum producers in the world. Our prices have gone up um, 
27 percent uh, up until the Ukraine uh, in incursion, we're expecting prices to go up as much as 60 percent. They try to drink the cost as much as possible, but their small operation will be forced to put some of the burden on customers. Ultimately, we will probably pass on at some point the exact size of the increase we're getting. Gerardo says they're getting creative with the cans and labels they're using, and luckily they're also able to bottle their beer. We just try to look forward, maintain our growth, but also know that um, there's little we can do to negotiate better pricing. We're just lucky to get what we need. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. After a two-year break because of the pandemic, the San Antonio International Women's Day March was back on today. This was the annual event's 32nd year meant to lift up visions of justice in local and global communities. Organizers say this year's March slogan, We Will Not Be Moved, honors the legacy of local and global strikes in defense of urban and agricultural workers' rights. Today, the San Antonio International Women's Day organizers say that health care, housing, information, education, migration, and nutrition are all human rights. We're here to demand and stand in solidarity with all the different oppressions um, that we all need to fight together. Organizers say this is the longest running annual march in San Antonio that is not commissioned by the city. Pretty day for that walk, but uh, early this morning you needed to bundle up. It's yeah, chilly out mm -hmm. there. Bundled, but the sun, you're right, yes. made it so beautiful out. But we're headed towards chilly weather, <laughs> chilly temperatures. Yes, it is going to be cold again early tomorrow. But just like today, we'll have a lot of sun and that'll help to warm us up. We end up closer to 70 tomorrow and then next week, 70s and 80s each afternoon. Much more even keeled weather next week. No more of these big temperature swings. So some good news there. Don't forget about the time change overnight. This uh, is the one where we lose an hour of sleep, but it also makes our sunrise and sunset times later. So today sunset was at 640. Tomorrow it'll be at 7. 41, so the sun will start going down a bit later. I know folks uh, typically enjoy that versus the early sunsets. Low temperatures this morning, a record low in Del Rio, 26 there, 21 in Hondo, 26 here in San Antonio, some teens, 20, the low in Fredericksburg. Catula, you were just a couple degrees warmer than freezing this morning. Now overnight, I expect another widespread freeze. Catula, that includes you. You should be able to drop down to 32 overnight because winds will be just a bit lighter tonight than they were last night. That, along with the clear skies we have in place and the very dry air, just a perfect recipe for another widespread freeze. Low to mid 20s across the hill country, a low around 28 in Canyon Lake, 31 Gonzales, 32 in Beeville, and a low around 30 in Del Rio to start the day tomorrow. But look at your morning lows heading into next week. Much more seasonable, 40s and 50s. So this will be our last night with a freeze. By Monday morning, our lows will be about 20 degrees warmer. Our afternoons will be warmer next week as well with highs in the 70s and 80s. So one more cold night, one more freeze, and then much more seasonable and warmer heading into next week. Mostly clear now at the airport. Really hard, though, to find a cloud in the sky. 47 degrees and light southerly winds at around 7 miles per hour. It's 38 in New Braunfels right now, also 38 in Kerrville. 46 currently in Catula. Check out our dew point numbers. That front that moved in yesterday obviously brought in a very cold air mass, but also a very dry air mass. It's not common for us to see dew point numbers in the teens and single digits, uh, but that's how low these numbers are tonight. And again, it's this very, very dry air that will help our temperatures both minimize overnight and then maximize tomorrow afternoon. Winds are calm from Pleasanton down to Beeville, also up in Fredericksburg, elsewhere, just about 5 to 10 miles per hour. And that's where our wind speeds will stay overnight, again, allowing us to land below freezing early on Sunday. By lunchtime, we're warming up 30 degrees, 60 at noon tomorrow, close to 70 when all is said and done tomorrow afternoon with a nice southerly breeze, about 10 to 20 miles per hour, and just a few fair weather clouds trying to sneak in toward the end of the day on Sunday. By Monday morning, we'll have a few more morning clouds. Also, a little bit of patchy fog will be possible as our dew points try to rebound just a little bit. Monday afternoon, a warm afternoon with plenty of sunshine. But look, we've got another front to our north. 
No worries here. This is a Pacific cold front, which means it's coming from the West Coast. It's not pulling down cold air. It's just pulling in more dry air for us. This will move through Monday night into Tuesday to keep our humidity low. We will have a brief window for a little bit of rain Monday night as this front is coming through. The best chances will be east of the I-35 corridor after midnight by 6 a.m. before the sun even comes up on Tuesday. This rain is long gone and then we'll start to see our humidity drop into Tuesday. But just to reiterate here, this rain chances essentially only for those um, along and east of 35 north of Highway 90 and then really along and east of 37 uh, to the south of Bear County there. But even those that get rain are not going to see very much rain. Some isolated spots could get less than a quarter inch of rain, but this is going to be a widespread less than a tenth of an inch of rain event here. And again, the window for any rain is going to be very, very brief. Otherwise, a dry forecast as far as rain is concerned over the next seven days. But these temperatures much more stable than what we were looking at this time last week, guys. Getting off the roller coaster yeah. just for a little bit. Yeah. A little bit better spring break for those who are off yeah, this week. That's true. <laughs> All right, Andrew, the Spurs uh, on a second half of a back to back tonight. Yeah, and I'm sure a couple of them want to rewind to the festivities that were yesterday without Coach Pop breaking the record for all time wins. Tonight's game didn't go quite as well. We come back, Spurs were down three starters, but they still battled hard against the Pacers. We got the highlights and reaction. Plus, San Antonio Cole plays for the state title at the Alamo Dome. We've got the highlights next. Hey Pop, it's your old buddy Nelly here. I just want to tell you how proud I am of all your accomplishments and the wonderful things you've done for basketball worldwide. Uh, but I'm most proud of what you're about to accomplish now, which is to put me in second place at all-time wins. And uh, I'm so proud of you for doing it. Don Nelson congratulated Coach Pop on surpassing his mark to become the NBA's all-time winningest head coach with 1,336 victories in big board sports. But that was last night. Pop and the Spurs turned the page quickly, hosting the Indiana Pacers tonight with a chance to win back-to-back -back games for the first time since the All-Star break, but they're down three starters. Doesn't seem to matter much early on. Doug McDermott knifes his way through the defense for the lay-in, and San Antonio leads 6-0. Later in the corner, Josh Primo finds Jacques Landale down low for the two-handed jam, and we're all tied at 15 all. The Pacers find some separation late in the frame, and they end up leading 34-26 after one. Second quarter, Spurs need some energy. How about Devin Vassell driving for the one-handed jam? And then a little later, Primo finds Kata Bates Diop for the dunk. Spurs are attacking the rim, but they still end up trailing this one 71-64 at the break. Fast forward to the fourth quarter now. Spurs trying to rally down 15 for the second straight night. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, knocks down a triple to cut the lead back down to 11. He scored 20 points off the bench. A few minutes later, Josh Richardson comes up with the steal, and he flips it ahead to Landale for another slam on the break. Landale posted a team-high 26 points tonight. Richardson had 16, but Indiana was just too good. Tyrese Halliburton led the Pacers with 19 points. They end up cruising to the win, 119-108. to uh, I think we worked hard. We weren't, we weren't really that sharp. Uh, you know, we didn't shoot very well. Uh, just weren't very sharp. But we worked hard, didn't give in, just didn't play well. Bottom line, it happens. Pop already back to regular season form. Spurs homestand continues on Monday night against the Timberwolves. Tip off is set for 7.30 p.m. It is number one versus number two for the UIL Class 3A state title this afternoon at the Alamo Dome in a matchup two years in the making. Cole versus Dallas Madison. Cougars trailed this one by 10 at halftime, but they seized control in the third quarter. Silas Livingston gets it back out to James Livingston for three, and he's got it. That cuts the deficit back down to two, 35-33. And then Silas finds Trey Blackmore for a triple from the wing, and the Cougars take their first lead of the game, 40-37. They're up by one heading into the fourth quarter, so back and forth we go in the fourth. Kenny Atune race gets it the fall, count it and one. Ten big points for Kenny, and Cole goes up 47-46. They start to pull away here. First, Silas finds some space and gets the floater to drop in for two of his ten points and a three-point lead. And after a Madison basket, Dre Ray drives inside for the layup to give the Cougars a 51-48 lead with a minute and 37 seconds left to play. But the Trojans score the next five points of the game, including this three from Latrell Wright, to give them a two-point lead with 18 seconds left in regulation. 
Blackmore with a chance to win it at the buzzer with the three here, but it's no good. Cougars come up short in their bid for a repeat. 53 to 51 is the final. Got around my first man. Another man stepped up. Saw the clock. There's about two seconds left. Um, I knew we needed a three, so I went for it and uh, missed it. I thought it was a great game. I thought, you know, um, they jumped out to a lead early. Uh, I thought we, you know, we battled back. I mean, that's what that's what great teams do. Um, just, you know, they made a couple more plays at the end. We worked hard all season. We made it this far. Teams don't usually make it this far. And I know the fans got our back and my teammates got our back. So even though we didn't get the first place like we wanted, we still got the second place. Cole ends their remarkable season with a 32-9 overall record. Coming up later in sports, Cowboys say goodbye to Amari Cooper. The details on their trade coming up. I know Tim's probably happy about what it does for the Cleveland Browns here. Well, we'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cost of living is going up almost daily with gas, rent, and groceries. Economists saying consumers might be able to handle the rise in prices, but others saying it could hurt everyone. And a controversial new law in Florida limits how schools can teach about history and diversity. How some say this is a personally affecting them when the night beat continues. There is a wave of new legislation limiting how schools can teach about history and diversity. One of the latest bills could soon become law in Florida. It's called the, per the Parental Rights in Education Bill. It is better known to critics as the Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida. It prohibits uh, a school district from encouraging classroom discussions about sexual orientation or gender identity in primary grade levels and lets a parent sue a school district that breaks the law. Todd and Jeff Delmay are Florida's first legally married same-sex couple and are concerned about the impact this legislation could have on their 12-year-old son. Well, I was just in Tallahassee. I was there actually in the room when they voted on it in the Senate. And the first thing when I told him that it had passed was there was a look of concern and he asked, will I be able to talk about my family? For so many, this is deeply personal. That includes Florida's first openly gay state senator, Shervin Jones, who says he spoke to young people about this bill in his office. Once signed, Florida's parental rights and education bill would take effect as soon as July 1st. Two people were killed by a camel after it escaped a Tennessee petting zoo this week. The Obion County Sheriff's Department responded to a call that the loose camel was acting aggressively. Deputies found two unconscious victims and were rendering aid when that camel attacked their patrol car. 42-year-old Bobby Matheny and 67-year-old Tommy Gunn died from their injuries. The officers who responded were forced to euthanize the animal. To Washington, D.C. now where an elderly man lost control of his SUV and crashed into the people eating outside in a downtown area on Friday. Two women died and six others were injured. Authorities say just after noon, a group of mostly elderly people were eating at a sidewalk cafe. That's when they say the driver lost control. A total of eight people were taken away by ambulance, five in critical condition. A jeweler on the block says it was the worst possible place someone could lose control. Other witnesses were in shock. Two minutes earlier and I would have been dead or hit because I was going to sit outside right where the, the accident happened. But fortunately, I was two minutes late. Three other victims who were hurt remain in critical condition. In Wisconsin, the man accused of killing six people at a 2021 parade in Waukesha will uh, head to trial in October. 39-year-old Daryl Brooks Jr. was in court on Friday. Brooks previously pled not guilty to 77 charges against him. Six people were killed and more than 60 others injured that day. Police say Brooks drove an SUV through the crowd at a Christmas parade last November. The lead investigator in the case previously testified that Brooks zigzagged his SUV through the crowd and appeared to be aiming for people. Brooks is expected back in court on March 29th. Inflation keeps climbing higher and it's affecting nearly everything. Skyrocketing gas prices, rents going through the roof, even groceries are taking a heavier toll. Small business owners around the world saying how unpredictable prices have become. And of course, we're all feeling the economic pain at the pump. That pain is worst in California, where gas prices are higher than any other state in the U.S., and financial fears already impacting families. Independent truck driver Ruben Ponce is deeply affected by the skyrocketing price of fuel. It's $100 more today, and it was also $100 more two days ago. And I mean, just think about it. It's an extra $800 a month. I mean, I, I don't care who you are. That's going to hurt you. 
Economists say consumers should be able to handle the rising prices, but people like Ponce fear that the average consumer will not be able to. More rising prices. Uber users are about to see a gas surcharge on their bills. The rideshare company says it is rolling out a temporary fuel fee to offset record high gas prices. This will apply to rides and Uber Eats deliveries starting on March 16th. The money will go directly to drivers, the company says. You can expect to pay up to 45 cents on each Uber Eats order or up to 55 cents per ride. The only exception is in New York City where drivers recently received an increase. Uber says it will reevaluate that surcharge in 60 days. On Friday, AAA recorded the national average for a gallon of regular gas at $4.33. Some Walgreens and CVS pharmacy locations are now ready to test people for COVID and treat those who test positive with antiviral medicines. It's part of the White House's Test to Treat initiative. More than 1,000 pharmacy and clinic locations received COVID-19's antiviral pills this week. The White House says both the COVID testing and the oral medications are free. It's some people's least favorite time of the year when we spring forward, trading in an hour of sleep for a little more daylight, why it was all started and why some people would like to put an end to it. And while we are seeing more daylight as this changes, some states are still experiencing dark, gloomy weather. After the break, which part of the nation is very over that winter weather? The clocks may be springing ahead tonight, but winter is not done with parts of the south and east coast. Here's ABC's Elwin Lopez with the details. A late winter storm dumping snow from Louisiana up through to the northeast. Memphis, Tennessee hit with more than two inches of snow. Bill Street usually crowded on the weekends, empty as the wintry mix moved in. Residents in Tupelo, Mississippi urged to stay off the roads as the city got a dusting of snow. Tornado warnings in place Saturday morning for parts of central Florida and Georgia. Beachgoers in Fort Myers, Florida running for cover as this water spout moved onto the beach. Parts of the Carolinas through to southern Virginia also seeing strong winds and the potential for tornadoes. Tens of thousands without power from Florida to Pennsylvania. That storm now moving along the east coast, parts of central New York, could see six inches of snow. Some residents in the Northeast are not happy about this late winter blast. I definitely uh, do not like the snow and I'm looking forward to warmer temperatures. Hundreds of flights have already been canceled for today and while it feels like we are stuck in the winter, the good news is that the storm will be out of here by the end of the weekend. Elwin Lopez, ABC News, Atlanta. So at 2 a.m. we'll spring forward one hour. One positive thing about daylight saving time is the extra sunshine in those summer evenings. Back in 1907, an Englishman noticed some people, quote, wasting the daylight. That's when the conversation about changing our clocks began. The current daylight saving period was established with the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and went into effect in 2007. As of 2021, 33 states have proposed bills to end daylight saving time, but legislation cannot take effect until the federal law changes. Arizona and Hawaii do not follow daylight saving time. Someone should have told that person to pay. Stay out of it. Stay out of yeah, it. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Who cares if they're wasting time? Mind it's their time to waste. Mind your own beeswax. That's right. That's um, right. And th why is it spring for it? Like I get it spring because of the season, but when I think spring, I think of, you know, energetic spring yeah. forward, but we're like, Dragging. Slugging. Forward. Drag forward. Yeah. Everyone, no one's going to be springy tomorrow. After We're all fans lose. of this, you can tell, right? <laughs> Woo! It's an hour of sleep. I know, but there's really nothing we could do about it, I guess, for now. Uh, just a reminder of how your sunrise and sunset times will change from today to tomorrow. The sun comes up around 745 on Sunday, and then it sets around 741. So that's the good news. I think a lot of folks like having the sunset a little bit later. More on your Sunday forecast and what's ahead over the next week or so coming up. All right, I'll balance this out here. I am excited to be able to like walk after work when I'm working, you know, yeah. the day shift. It's been difficult when it gets darker earlier, so it's yeah. nice to, it's nice for that, but but nobody's excited about <laughs> losing an hour of sleep. Yeah. That's just an excuse for me Benefits to, aside. to drink some extra coffee in the yeah. morning. So. More Red Bull. Two tomorrow. Red Bull. Two tomorrow. Two Red Bull. Oh, my God. How? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Can't wait for 5.30. Good luck dealing with me tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my God. It's going to be a joy. Watch us tomorrow. 5.30. 5.30. Uh, all right. Let's start with your car wash forecast. I wanted to bring this up. I noticed some long lines at area car washes today. Even though we didn't get a a lot of measurable rain, a few one hundredths of an inch of rain Friday with the cold front. Uh, your car may be looking a little dirty. Uh, you're good to go over the next few days um, as far as the car wash goes. Now, the one caveat here is going to be Monday night. We have a chance for some quick hitting showers and non severe storms as a Pacific cold front moves through. Otherwise, no chance of rain in the next seven days. So just keep that. Monday night rain chance in the back of your mind. If you can get the car under cover in a garage, uh, you would be just fine to wash it tomorrow or on Monday. Let's talk about the specific cold front. So it's a Pacific cold front because it's coming from the West Coast, so it's not pulling down cold air from Canada and the Arctic. It's just pulling in drier air. So our afternoon high temperatures, our morning lows, they will not be affected very much by this cold front. It's just going to help to keep our humidity on the lower side this week, and that's some good news. I do wish, though, it would help us out a bit more with rain. It does look like we'll have a line of some showers and some non severe storms east of I 35 as we get into very late Monday night. So likely after midnight and through the pre dawn hours of Tuesday morning, there will be some showers east of the I 35 corridor. This is all going to move through very quickly by the pre dawn hours of Tuesday morning. All of that is well down to the south. So this will be a brief window for some rain. As far as rainfall totals here again, generally along 35 north of Highway 90 and then along 37 south of Highway 90 widespread totals of less than a tenth of an inch and then a few isolated pockets of less than a quarter inch of rain. So this is not going to do much for us at all, but at least it's a little something I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few rumbles of thunder over some of our easternmost counties Monday night. Again, this Pacific cold front will just help to keep our dew points lower. They'll try to jump up Monday into the 50s. Then that front comes through to drop them down Tuesday and Wednesday and then a very similar scenario toward the end of the week Thursday into Friday. Another Pacific cold front coming through will again not affect our high and low temperatures very much. It'll just help to keep humidity on the lower side into next weekend. All quiet on satellite and radar. Looks like we've got some high clouds from Laredo over to Corpus Christi. Otherwise skies are clear. 39 New Valley right now 47 here in San Antonio and 35 in Pleasanton. Here's where I expect your temperatures will land through tomorrow morning. Another widespread freeze. We've got clear skies, light winds, very dry air. So it'll be another cold night. Low to mid 20s across the hill country. A low around 31 in Carrizo Springs. Also a low around 31 in Gonzales through tomorrow. And again, a big factor here with our temperatures minimizing overnight is how low our dew points are currently. They're in the single digits west of I-35. Our dew point is 12 here in San Antonio. This is uh, not really common for us here. We, you know, get dew points on the lower side behind these fronts, but typically not uh, in the single digits. And again, winds are light calm from Beeville up to Pleasanton. Tomorrow we'll have a nice south breeze pick up in the morning. Winds will still be light, but by lunchtime and through the afternoon, our winds will be south about 10 to 20 miles per hour. That's going to factor into what's going to be a really nice into the weekend cold in the morning, but we're up to 60 by lunchtime, close to 70 in the afternoon with that south breeze. It's uh, really going to be a very comfortable day tomorrow. Uh, all right, we talked about those two Pacific cold fronts, one with a chance of some rain Monday night, St. Patrick's Day looking nice here with the afternoon high in the low 80s, guys. Nice temperatures, low humidity. Yeah. Meh. Meh. <laughs> Look at Tim. Not, not, not much to complain <laughs> about. There. Just, I'll, I'll go with it. He just wants his Red Bull. I need it already, but I won't sleep. <laughs> All right, Andrew, somehow you're expecting I'm excited about this Amari Cooper trade to the Browns. I'm wondering, what did he do to upset somebody that he ended up in Cleveland? <laughs> You know, that's a, that's a good way to phrase it, I suppose. I, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with his personality. I think it has everything to do with trying to get money enough to re-sign Ezekiel Elliott, among other things. The Cowboys are already in some cap trouble. When we come back, we'll talk about the Amari Cooper trade to Cleveland and see what it does for the Cowboys. Plus, college basketball, huge shot here from an Alyssa Smith's father. We've got that next.